and welcome to the book podcast, talking with Australian women writers of fiction and non-fiction. I'm Rosemary Putty. Hello and welcome to episode 113 of the book podcast and our book this week is The Scholar by Dervila McTiernan. The Scholar is the second book in the Detective Cormac Riley series. Dervil and Tiernan's debut novel, The Ruin, was a critically acclaimed international bestseller, which has been published in the US, the UK and Ireland, with other territories to follow in 2019. The Ruin was shortlisted in two categories for the 2018 Irish Book Awards and was named on the Amazon US Best Book of the Year list 2018. Dervla was born in County Cork, Ireland, to a family of seven. She studied corporate law at the National University of Ireland, Galway, and the Law Society of Ireland, and practiced as a lawyer for 12 years. Following the global financial crisis, she moved with her family to Western Australia, where she now lives with her husband and two children. An avid fan of crime and detective novels from childhood, Dervla now writes full-time. When Dr Emma Sweeney stumbles across the victim of a hit and run outside Galway University late one evening, she calls her partner, Detective Cormac Riley, bringing him to the scene of a murder that would otherwise never have been assigned to him. A security card in the dead woman's pocket identifies her as Carleen Darcy, a gifted student and heir apparent to Irish pharmaceutical giant Darcy Therapeutics. The multi-billion dollar company founded by her grandfather, sponsors university research facilities and has funded Emma's own groundbreaking work. The inquiry into Carleen's death promises to be high profile and high pressure. As Cormac investigates, evidence mounts that the death is linked to a Darcy laboratory and increasingly to Emma herself. Cormac's running of the case comes under scrutiny and he's forced to question his own objectivity. Could his loyalty to Emma have led him to overlook evidence? And has it made him a liability? Internationally best-selling crime writer Dervla McTiernan is my guest today on the book podcast. Her compulsive new crime thriller, The Scholar, is the second instalment in the Cormac Riley series. Detective Riley is forced to question himself and his beliefs when assigned to a murder case that should never have been his. Set in the halls of academia, where the brightest minds will stop at nothing to succeed, The Scholar is a gripping and atmospheric follow-up to The Ruin. Hello, Dervla, and welcome back to the book podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Rosemary, and thank you for that very generous introduction. (laughs) Well, Dervla, we talked last year when your debut novel, The Ruin, was published, and gosh, what a year it's been. I mean, it's been such a runaway success, this book. So it's been such a mad year. Are your feet back on the ground yet? And what, (laughs) what have been some of the highlights for you? Oh, God, I don't know. I sometimes feel like I life these days is kind of a series of mad excitement and then complete normalcy. You know, it just flips from one to the other with nothing in between because I'm either at home looking after kids and writing or I'm off gallivanting and doing events and stuff. And there's just no no normal life anymore. <laughs> it's this or the other. So I don't know if my feet ever fully hit the ground in that I'm now writing full time, which of course is a complete dream come true since last October I'm writing full time and, and I don't know if that's ever going to fully sink in. I mean, every day I wake up and feel lucky that I'm doing that. So it's pretty great. Before we get to talk about the new book, The Scholar, for the few listeners out there who aren't familiar with your main character, Cormac Riley, tell us a little bit about him. What, what is it he does and where has he come from? Well, Cormac is a police detective. He is a detective sergeant in the Irish police force. And in the first book, The Ruin, he has just come back to Galway, which is a town in the west of Ireland from Dublin, from the capital city. 
in Dublin, he was running an anti-terrorism unit and he was, you know, very successful and kind of highly regarded and well respected in his job. And then his partner, Emma, got a job, fantastic job opportunity in the west of Ireland. So they kind of moved for her job and it leaves him starting again. You know, you can imagine coming down to a smaller town from the big city and you're held out as this great guy. Nobody particularly wants to see you succeed. I think it's human nature. So he's assigned a bunch of, you know, no hope or cold cases. And I mean, I'm talking about cases so bad that all the witnesses are dead and all the evidence is lost. And more in a sort of effort to show him up than anything else. And then after some period of time, he is assigned this case, which is from his own past, um, where 20 years before he had found these two children abandoned in this country house and their mother was dead in a room upstairs. And he never really got to the bottom of that case. He was very young at the time and didn't have the experience to kind of push through. And so now as an older man, he's going back to find out the truth of what happened that night. So that that was from The Ruin, really. And then The Scholar is the follow-on book, the second book in the series. The Scholar, honestly, it's a fantastic book, but it's a tricky book to talk about without giving anything away. But we'll do our best. I know. <laughs> it's brutal, isn't it? It is, it is. <laughs> But in The Scholar, Emma, Cormac's girlfriend, is front and centre in the story. So what happens in the opening chapter and why did you make her central to the plot? I think I think because Emma and Cormac's backstory is hinted at in The Ruin, but not fully explored. And she is so fundamentally important to him and how he sees himself. He's really kind of going through a period of change in his life when these books start. You know, he's always been very dedicated to his job, but life's been pretty good to Cormac. You know, he's he's been popular. He chose a job that suits him well, so he's had success. And life has kind of been going his way. And now he's growing up and he's hitting 40 and looking around and wondering what he really wants. And then he falls in love with this woman and everything changes for him. But they meet in very dramatic circumstances that I can't tell you or tell your listeners that ruining it. And that's just sort of referred to in passing and ruin, but you don't really get to hear what happened until you come to the scholar. And I think that when the story for the scholar came to me, the the mirror with Emma and Cormac's own life just was so obvious. It just had to be about them, really, and about Emma. And what happens to her in that she opens the book? So what what's actually the opening scene? So in the opening scene, Emma, so Emma's a research scientist. She's very, very successful, very dedicated, really, really driven with her work. And she goes into work late one Friday evening to the laboratory to check some test results. And the lab, the lab is located on the campus grounds, which is the same university I went, I went to when I was in college. And anyway, she, she's going in there to check the test results and she stumbles across the body of a young woman who has been the victim of a hit and run. And the scene is really distressing. So she calls Cormac straight away and understandably enough, he comes running and he ends up taking the case, which he probably shouldn't be doing, given that his girlfriend is the person who found the body. I mean, there's an obvious conflict there, but he manages to rationalise it in his own head and he's given room to run with it. So he's taking this case, which ends up being very high profile and very high pressure because the young woman is identified as Carleen Darcy, who's the granddaughter of an extremely wealthy, politically connected family, the same family who sponsored Emma's own research. So as the story progresses and without giving too, too much away, quite late, you know, later in the story, comes, Cormac comes across little pieces of evidence that suggest that maybe, maybe Emma's discovery of the body wasn't quite as innocent as it originally seemed. Well, that's so true. And Cormac, being a strictly procedural policeman, being assigned to this case has actually put him in a difficult position. So what challenges did you want him to face in the story? I think with Cormac, it's my my view is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think he has had it lucky. I think life has been very good to him, but not in a way that he recognizes. I mean, look, he's he's a man. He's a good looking man. He's popular. He was sporty in school. You know, all of these simple things that seem like nothing, but actually add up to a lot of advantage. And so he's a really decent guy, but he's a decent guy who's had life go his way. And what I'm interested in the books is really what happens when you take a really decent person and you put them in a situation where their choices are not black and white. It's not here is the right road, here is the wrong road, but here are two equally awful roads. Make a choice. And then after you've made that choice, how do you see yourself? You know, when you can't see yourself as this completely morally upright black and white person anymore, how do you adapt to your new view of yourself and and does it impact then your choices from that period point on because to me that's more interesting I think 
most of us who are adults in the world understand that those are the choices we're presented with regularly, much more regularly than you think. You're, you very rarely get a clean option. You know, if you're making a choice to help one person out, you're letting another person down. If you're looking after your own health or eating healthily, it means you might be spending less time with your kids. You know, it's, it's always a series of bad choices. And we all have to figure out who we are after we've made them. So for me in, in the scholar, that's what it is for Cormac. He has to, he's presented with a number of choices and he has to make them. And then he has to figure out who he is after he's made them. Well, as you said, you've set the story uh, in the university in Galway where you went to. And I hope it wasn't as sinister a place as it, it seems to be in the story. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about the canvas that you've, you know, it really lends itself to a crime story? Oh, it is kind of spooky. I have to say, campus is pretty spooky. It's funny because the front of the, the Australian cover has this beautiful picture of the Aula Maxima, which is this, you know, ivied stone, cut stone building, which is dates from the 1800s, which is part of the university. But if the camera that was taking that photograph had panned to the right, you would have seen a lot of not so pretty 1950s or 1970s <laughs> buildings that also form part of the campus. And there was this big, long um, building we call the Concourse, which bizarrely they built looking away from the beautiful river that runs through campus, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, a lot of the lectures when I went to college were held in the Concourse and the tutorials too. And if you had a tutorial deep in the bowels of the building and then, you know, you made the mistake of taking your time packing up or going to the loo afterwards or something and you're the last one there, I'll tell you, there is nothing more spooky than that because all of a sudden there are sounds corridors are absolutely empty it's like a Stephen King novel I mean it's just you're immediately freaked out or at least I used to be so I always felt that it, there were parts of campus that were a little bit spooky and a little bit scary and it just felt like a good place to, to set a, a murder mystery. Emma does work at the university she's not studying there she's doing research there so tell us a little bit about her and her role at the university. So Emma's been sponsored effectively by her research, headhunted by this company, by a company called Darcy Therapeutics, because she has a particular brilliance for biotechnical design, if you like. And so she's leading a team that is developing the world's first artificial kidney. So her work has brought her a lot of attention. She's had a lot of success in the past, but this is the project that she really wants to to get over the line and she's been brought here particularly because of other research that's being done within this laboratory that complements her own. So she's making a lot of progress initially and then progress seems to slow um, and so there's kind of an overlap with the two stories there. As you said in the first book we learn a little bit of um, Emma and Cormac's backstory and you've elaborated on on this here, I'm not going to give it away, but but it does serve to cloud the issue for their relationship, not only for the case but for their relationship. Yeah, I think it's like any relationship where you're bringing something, you're bringing a history and you're bringing a trauma and you can either you can either build each other up around it, you recover together and you build a scaffold that you lift each other up. Despite your best efforts, it kind of pulls you both down and the only way to move forward is separately. And I suppose the question for Cormac and Emma is, which will that be, you know, for them, which will it be? You've told the story from multiple points of view, which not only gives insight into the characters, but it certainly muddies the waters as to who the perpetrator is and such a, a good idea for, for a crime story because we're never really sure who's telling the truth. Oh, excellent. That's just what I wanted. That's really <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> well, we, we not only get the main storyline, but you do love a good subplot, which makes for... Oh, a... you know I love a subplot. <laughs> One that makes for a wonderfully constructed story and it's a bit of a trademark now for your writing. So what is it that you love about a subplot and how difficult is it to weave it all together in the edit? Well, do you know, my biggest problem is too many subplots. I, I do mm. like it because I like the layers. You know, I, I like the complexity as long as it is organic and it doesn't feel tacked on. So I always start with the character and I write a lot of backstory for the characters. So I pages and pages and pages of things that never appear in the book you know I might know the, the the entire childhood experience of a particular character and how she got on with her parents even though the parents never appear in the page and what I find when you do that is that the tendrils of relationships between the characters almost self-generate after a while and the subplots almost self-generate because you know you're, you're not creating ordinary people you're creating people who are unusual in some way and maybe they're particularly weak in some way or maybe they've got some 
particularly traumatic backstory or maybe they've got a very driving need but they're all a little bit different they're all a little bit unusual and then you put all of these people into one confined space in the story and subplots almost generate you know and sometimes you might find that a a bit of backstory for that you just wrote for a character so that you got to know them well enough is suddenly very relevant to the story and, and, and almost of necessity becomes a subplot in the story. I find those books more satisfying when, there's, when there are a few layers to them. Well, your book deals also with a number of different themes, domestic violence, greed and corporate influence, and also how the events of the financial crisis have affected Ireland and how years later some of those effects are still being felt. Well, they are. I mean, it's... I sometimes think it's hard for people if you weren't in Ireland to understand how profound the impact was, how, how significant it was. It was absolutely devastating um, for the country. If you try to imagine a situation where half of the people in your family loses their job or if some, you know, your extended family or if they keep their job, they've had a 30 percent pay cut. You know, your house is worth less than half of what you paid for it. Taxes have gone up. It was just absolutely brutal. And there are, you know, the economy has largely recovered in Ireland, but the individuals who are impacted by it, a lot of them haven't because they were caught at a really bad time in their lives. Either they were older people who didn't have the option of going back to work to pay off a loan or whatever else, or they were younger people who were told, you must get on the property ladder, you know, so they buy a a one bedroom apartment an hour and a half out of Dublin and they have a mortgage and now they've got two kids and they're still commuting that hour and a half every day in and out and they really have no way out because they can't sell their apartment for anything close to what they owe in the mortgage and it's just the sort of impact that something like that has is lifelong for some people and it's very easy if you just read the papers to think that it's all over and done with but for a lot of people unfortunately it, it isn't you know. And that's actually relevant to some of your characters because they're still suffering from stress and almost like PTSD from all of the things that have happened. Yeah, and I think that is absolutely the case for a lot of people. I really don't think, I think a lot of people won't, you know, haven't recovered and won't. And I think that, I think we we can believe that life will always go on as it has. You know, humans have a, a tendency to have that expectation, but when then when something so unexpected and so profound happens and changes your entire society, it can be very hard to recover from. It can indeed. In the story, as well as Cormac and Emma, there are lots of interesting characters all the way throughout the book. But I especially liked Carrie O'Halloran. Tell us a little bit about her. Oh, I love Carrie. Carrie is, she's a cop. She's a mother of two young girls. She's married and she's very good at her job. She's tough because she has to be tough. And she's fought hard to ha- hold her position um, in the world. But she's still fighting hard because, of course, she's facing the reality that a lot of mums have. She's a working mum of two kids. Her husband probably isn't quite as supportive as he could be, although that kind of goes up and down. And she's torn because she loves her job. She's really good at it, but she loves her girls. And she just feels like she cannot quite make both work at the same time she's balancing relationships in the station because she's a little bit more of a peacemaker than Cormac would be perhaps or she's got stronger relationships with the senior police and the junior police and she's trying to bridge the gap but at the same time her work is always the thing that comes first so I think her relationship with Cormac is quite interesting and I'm interested to see how that develops in the next book. Cormac's situation at work isn't helped with Emma being a suspect in this case. And the work, no. <laughs> the, the work scenes are littered with all sorts of workplace situations, you know, dealing with the hierarchy in, in the station of jealousy, budgets, and also increasingly the pressure brought to bear by the wealthy and powerful because the girl that was killed right at the beginning of the book is linked to a wealthy and powerful man. Well, I'm very interested in, in the subtlety of influence because I think... It, we can sometimes assume that if somebody isn't outright bribed, then everything's fine. But I think that the wealthy and powerful wield their influence in more subtle ways these days, but they're no less effective. And sometimes if you peel back the layers, you can see a little bit more of what goes on. So in the book, that's one of the things I'm trying to sort of demonstrate. And, you know, with the police, for example, it can be something as simple as intimidation. You know, it doesn't have to be anything dishonest. You can simply be conscious that, well, this person has enormous wealth and enormous resources. 
and they can make life extremely difficult for us just by being public, you know, just by using their lawyers and being public. And that alone can result, will inevitably result in those people being treated differently from your average Joe Soap off the street. But that can have a profound influence on how things are run and how things are dealt with. So I, I wanted to show that as well as the more extreme examples of sort of that sort of heavy duty influence being brought to bear. But I wanted to show the more subtle ones because I think sometimes that can be a little more insidious. Well, it did have quite an effect on the case. But towards the end of the book, I believed I had it all worked out. You know, I knew exactly where it was going and who the... Who the... <laughs> <laughs> who the bad people were but no I was completely wrong so really? oh, <laughs> I'm completely really? oh, wrong. I find out who you thought it was after, oh, after this I'll have to ask you completely wrong so <laughs> how do you plan for the twists and turns and the red herrings along the way I do a few different things I start with characters as I said and I write all my character backgrounds and character histories and then I write a sort of a sketched outline and that's not really much more than the few scenes that come to mind that I think would be most fun to write, that I'd be most excited to write. And I, I write those down, you know, a little brief paragraph on each. And then I will either do a more detailed outline or I'll start writing. But either way, I generally aim to write about 20,000 words before I stop. And at that point, I write a full synopsis. And that will be quite detailed. And that will have who I think the murder is going to be and how I think it will end. And then I'll go back and start again and I'll start really writing the book properly. But I'm very likely to throw that synopsis out any number of times through the writing of the book and write a new one because what I've learned is that characters do take on a life of their own and the story takes on a life of its own and if I am trying too hard to stick to a synopsis or what I originally thought setting out I can almost feel my hand on the page you know I can almost feel myself pushing people into place and and it just starts to feel like a cardboard cardboard story whereas and when I feel that now, I know enough to stop and sit back and, and backtrack and see where I lost the thread and then go back into the characters and say, well, why? Why does this not fit them? What would fit them better? What would they do? And sometimes the answer doesn't, pre- you know, the, the, the next step in the path presents itself, but not the answer. So I, I'll go down that path a bit of the way and see where it takes me and then rewrite a synopsis. So I'd like to have the plan because then I don't go down... 40,000 word blind alleys but I have to be free to bin it because otherwise you can kill your own story by just trying too hard to stick to a blueprint. Your books have great pace. How do you keep the feeling of movement going in the story? Well I think to be honest it's quite deliberate. I want it to be a pacey story. I want things to move along and for people to feel like there's action, action, action. So I do go back and I analyze that when I'm finished the story. I'll go back and look at my chapters and I'll say, does the chapter or the scene need to be here? Is something happening here that is fundamentally important to the story, either something that's giving rise to something else and kind of leads to, to a logical causality through the book or some fundamental insight to a character lies within this and it needs to be here for that reason or it's just a particularly joyful or whatever scene that I really feel is worth keeping despite the fact that it's missing those two things but if it's not ticking one of those three boxes then it goes it just goes and then it all has to be smoothed out so how has your writing developed over the course of of the of the Cormac Riley books I think it's changed quite a lot and the first book was very much just written with a blank page in front of me but the result of that was I probably wrote 250,000 words the 100,000 word book easily and I just scrapped and scrapped and scrapped reams of things that were subplots that weren't necessary or tangents that just didn't lead anywhere so it it took a lot of rewriting to pull it into shape. With The Scholar I was much more structural. I I used there's a book called Right Away by Elizabeth George. She writes mysteries very long and detailed and beautiful mysteries and she also wrote this book on writing. And in this, she sets out her technique and her her process. So I adapted a lot of her process for the scholar. It's very detailed. It's very much along the lines of what I was speaking about earlier. And I thought when I was writing that book, well, that's it. You know, this is this works for me. This is the way I'm going to write every book. This is fantastic. And then I started writing the third book, which will be called The Good Turn. It won't be out until next year. And I realized, uh oh, it's not working so well this time. And so I adapted it again. So it's still a process and it's still somewhat structured but I'm much more willing to just write by the seat of my pants when when it feels right 
Um, so it's a mix of the two. And I think probably as I get more experienced as a writer, I will have more of that instinctive writing as I become more skilled, I hope. I think that you just have more tools at your disposal and more things you can do almost instinctively without so much detailed back work. Yeah. But who knows? Who knows? Who knows? We'll see yeah. when I write the fourth one. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have a three book deal, I know, to write about Cormac and for me, this is really quite evident in the way that you've written the books because they're very visual and it's almost like watching a TV series. You know, when you have a, a resolution at the end of each book, but you've got a cliffhanger to make us eager to go on to do the next one. So we're such greedy readers, aren't we? I mean, <laughs> we've only just got this one out. We're looking at the next one. So when no, did you... I love that. I feel the same way myself about my the books I love. So when will the next one, did you say, when's that going to be published? Same time next year, so February next year. February next year, so that's great. But The Ruin has been such a huge success. And I have to ask you, how did you cope with the publicity trail and all the accolades that came with it, both here and overseas? Oh, gosh. I, Rosemary, it's such a very strange thing. I think you dream about these things. You know, you dream about this happening. Everybody who writes does, that your book will go on, it will be a bestseller and, and be well received and everything. And then it happens and it just, doesn't feel at all real it, I mean you just I think my expectations were of X and then something completely different happened and it didn't fit into my understanding of how the world <laughs> worked and so I just kept saying I don't I, I can't make sense of this it doesn't make sense to me and then I just said okay I'm not going to think about it anymore I'm just going to do the thing that's in front of me and someday months time from now I'll be sitting in the kitchen and I'll open a bottle of wine that will all start to sink in and I'm not sure if that has fully happened yet. I think it's beginning to. I, I feel more comfortable in my shoes as a writer than I did. And I'm beginning to understand the world a bit better. And small things make a difference now, too. You know, if I go to a literary festival now, there's a good chance I'm going to know a couple of people there. Yeah. Whereas last year, I didn't know a single person. And that's a scary thing. Now I know that there might be a friend there. That makes a big difference. So small things like that really help but but generally speaking the best bit about it all is that you're writing and you get to write and you get to come home and you get to write and that's just that's just the best you know well what do your husband and children think of all this adulation <laughs> well uh the kids are hilarious very particularly she every time i have an interview she says mom do you think they'll ask about me and I'm <laughs> like i'm not sure buddy we'll have to see about that well I, i'd love to ask about her yeah <laughs> Well, she's a writer herself. She's a writer and she draws. She's only nine, but she Aww. loves it. And, you know, her one thing she asked for over Christmas is that we'd have writing time together every day. Oh, so we tried wonderful. to do that, which was, was really cute. And I thought that, you know, she'd lose interest really fast. Like it would just be an excuse to sit and chat or something. But actually, you know, she was quite serious about it. We had to sit for an hour. And she wrote and I wrote. And every now and again, we'd have a chat about how our stories were going. And it was really sweet. So that's lovely. What sort of thing does she write? What does she like to She's write? She's into kind of fantasy. So her, she fell in love with these Wings of Fire books. They're written by Tweety Sutherland, I think her name is. She's an American writer. And Frey had always been a reader, but these books, she just someone recommended them to her at one of these book doctors at a literary festival. I don't know if you've come across these, but they're, they're awesome. No. It's this thing they often have in the kids' section at literary festivals, so or at writers' festivals. So you go along and you... There's someone, a bookseller will sit down and ask you about your interests and your different things. And then they'll make, they give you a prescription for a book. And so this ah. brilliant bookseller, there's like the, the book doctor, I think they called her. So she recommended these books to Freya. And my God, I mean, she is literally, they're about, I don't know, they're maybe 60, 70,000 word novels. And she's read every one of them four times. She's completely addicted. Oh so my goodness. It turned her from being a reader into a reader with a capital R. So, yeah, so that really captivated her completely. And so she's intent on being a writer when she grows up and obviously expects everything to be perfect because, you know, mum got published. So, like, you know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's just going to happen. <laughs> it's just going to happen. My little boy is less interested. He's, he's interested, but he's, you know, he's interested occasionally. Like, he doesn't seem to be that interested. And then I'll find out that he said something at school or he talked to his teacher about it. And I'll be like, oh, maybe he's a little bit proud. It just doesn't show it that, yeah. that much, you know. And my husband is hugely supportive. He has been from the very beginning. When I first said, I, I think maybe I might like to try writing. And he was like, well, why wouldn't you? You know, I mean, he's always been like that. So, yeah, I've been very lucky. Because it does take up big chunks of time and it's quite solitary. Well, for the first couple of years, it was, you know, I wrote every single night. I mean, I was, I was working during the day and then we were with the kids in the early evening. And then 
I would write every night except Thursday. I would write, and Thursday night we'd open a bottle of wine and we'd have a laugh and we'd have a chat. But he, that's a lot when you're a couple and you're not seeing that much of each other. And he never had an issue with it, you know. And then even when I was published and I was still trying to juggle my day job and all the publicity that came with it, and now suddenly travel as well, and he's having to pick up the pieces at home. And he just did. He just slid into the spot and just picked up the pieces and did more than his fair share of the childcare, and he was amazing. And so I think now we kind of get to reap the benefit of that, which is lovely. That's really lovely. Well, so book three, it's all done. So what are you planning next? <laughs> oh, I'm writing short at the moment, just in between. I, I finished book three, but I need to do the structural edit. So I'm kind of taking a, a breather from it just to let, let it sit for a little while, and then I'll go back and do the structural edit in about two weeks. I'll be getting into that properly. And then, then I'll be writing the fourth one. Will Cormac be back on the page for the fourth one? Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to move a little bit and it's going to be more of a Carrie book because I've always wanted, I always feel like Carrie deserves her own story. And so I have this idea in mind for a book that will be about Carrie. And I also feel that The Ruin and The Scholar and The Good Turn, the third book, are sort of a complete arc in themselves a lot of the things that I open in the ruin and continue in the scholar are really completed in, in the good turn. And so I feel like the next three books will be their own complete arc. So it will be more carry oriented. Cormac will still be there, but I think it will be more focused on carry. But don't hold me to that because I haven't written it yet. <laughs> I was going to say the people of Galway would be very pleased that you're still setting it all in Galway. <laughs> For now, anyway. <laughs> For now, yeah. Well, Dervla, I love The Scholar. It's a complex and totally captivating crime thriller. It's unpredictable, beautifully plotted, with both story and character twists to keep you guessing. It's a fascinating, emotional and completely addictive follow-up to The Ruin. And I want to thank you so much for coming back and talking to me again on the book podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Rosie. It's an absolute pleasure. And when The Good Turn is out next year, I'd love you to come back and have another chat. I would love to be back. Thank you. And that was Dervla McTiernan talking about her new book, The Scholar. Now next week we go from the hallowed halls of Galway University to wild and isolated southeastern Tasmania. And we're talking to Karen Vigors about her book, The Orchardist's Daughter. 16-year-old Michaela has grown up isolated and homeschooled on an apple orchard in southeastern Tasmania, until an unexpected event shatters her family. Eighteen months later, she and her older brother Kurt are running a small business in a timber town. Mickey longs to make connections and spend more time in her beloved forest, but she's kept a virtual prisoner by Kurt, who leads a secret life of his own. When Mickey meets Leon, another outsider, things slowly begin to change. But the power to stand up for yourself must come from within and Mickey has to fight to uncover the truth of her past and discover her strength and spirit. Set in the old-growth, eucalypt forests and vast rugged mountains of southern Tasmania, The Orchardist's Daughter is an uplifting story about friendship, resilience and finding the courage to break free. And that's next week on The Book Podcast. I hope you can join me. You've been listening to The Book Podcast. Details of this program can be found on our website, thebookpodcast.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. It's free. And please, while you're there, leave a review. It'd really help. You can follow us via Facebook and Twitter at The Book Podcast. I'm Rosemary Puddy. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Thank you for listening. <laughs>